Here in Chicago, the architect Mies van der Rohe has a very powerful presence. At this point, some of his building design strategies seem so obvious and ubiquitous that it's hard to remember that they were ever designed at all. They've pretty much become the background to everyday life and seem almost as natural as the lake, the horizon, and the sunset. Currently, I'm standing outside of a pair of towers designed by Mies that sit along the shore of Lake Michigan. Their names come from their address, 860-880 Lakeshore Drive. To the north of the block is 900-910, which was done seven years later. As a set, these towers represent a pretty refined approach to designing vertically for Mies van der Rohe, even though a number were still built after these. Still, these towers come many decades into his illustrious career and a little over a decade before his death. But I'd like to talk a little bit about how we got here. Not just talking about Mies' tower designs, but specifically how Mies designed in section or in the vertical direction and how this beautiful horizon behind me figures into it. If this building that I'm at represents a refined approach, what led up to this? And how can looking at this evolution allow us to read the complexity within the simplicity of this building? Before we get talking about privacy and Mies van der Rohe's architecture, I'd like to take a moment to discuss your privacy online. One of the most important things you can do for your online security is signing up for a VPN service. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount in time for Black Friday. It means you can get a three-year subscription for just $1.39 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Get your deal by clicking the link in the description below. I use Atlas VPN to watch unrestricted shows on Netflix and Amazon Prime that aren't otherwise available in the United States. I also use it to save money when signing up for subscription services, which can charge you more based on where you live. How else am I supposed to get my fill of Rick and Morty? Besides paying for itself with those subscription service savings, you'll also be treated to an enhanced level of security as Atlas VPN hides your IP address, blocks malicious links, ads and trackers, and even notifies you when someone is trying to steal your data. The deal in the link below makes Atlas VPN the best deal for VPN services right now, and there is no risk with their 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you're interested, click my special link in the description and get an early access to Black Friday deal with 86% off and three months for free. Just for a little bit of context, typically Mies thought about space as a field of relationships between objects, and the building's role was to frame and structure that field. While things like walls and other elements drift like they're floating in Lake Michigan within a Mies plan, the buildings often bracket those elements with horizontal surfaces or planes. These create new, independent, horizontal worlds that stack one on top of the other, maintaining fluid connections in the plan direction, but strong distinction between things in the vertical direction. If we go all the way back to the early 1920s, Mies was in his mid-30s when he embarked on a series of projects that seemed to break from his earlier work, where he began operating on a new set of issues. In 1921, he entered a competition for the design of a skyscraper. At this point, skyscrapers themselves were only a few decades old, and World War I had just concluded. Mises' tower design was actually the first design that he'd make after the war. While it was set for Berlin, just for context, Chicago was holding its own skyscraper competition around this time as well. The winner of the Chicago Tribune Tower competition was ultimately chosen from other more modern designs in favor of a Gothic-styled tower that we know today. But Mises' design for the Friedrichstrasse skyscraper was even more radical than anything submitted to the Chicago competition at the time. He used the springboard of this competition to set a new trajectory for both him personally and for his architecture. It was his first chance to explore a building type other than the country houses and to develop his own ideas about modernization and urban architecture, as well as how to use new materials and technologies of construction. And back in 1921, this design for a fully glass-sheathed skyscraper was really remarkable. It was based on the idea that a supporting steel skeleton could free the structure's exterior walls from their load-bearing function, allowing a building to have a surface more translucent than it is solid. Mies van der Rohe referred to this concept as an architecture of skin and bones. Inspired by the exposed structures of early American towers when they were being built, he argued that only skyscrapers under construction revealed the bold, constructive thoughts, and then the impression of the high-reaching steel skeletons is overpowering. So maybe we could make towers that stay a little closer to this less developed state, stay closer to a gridded skeleton before we cover up everything with opaque materials. Mies, wanting the interior to be as open as possible to the outside, he shed the tradition of stone entirely and proposed a skeleton structure with large sheets of plate glass hung like a curtain off of the edges of the floor slabs. These continuous planes of glass, they accentuated the vertical expression of the building along a street that was decidedly horizontal. 
The building was envisioned as a monumental, hollow crystal, an open frame wrapping glass. That building maybe foreshadows the one that we're at now, but because it was unbuilt and over 20 years before who would ever build a tower, it doesn't tell us as much about the details or what it would have been like to inhabit. So we can look at a series of his smaller built projects to continue to discern his vertical attitudes. Because while this tower seems very simple, the way that one experiences is anything but simple. In other projects, like the Barcelona Pavilion, important vertical elements include the plinth, which is that thick base that the rest of the building sits on. It extends beyond the building itself, with a relatively small staircase at its edge, oriented off to the side and pointing away from the rest of the composition. You first walk along the side of the building, facing away from it, and then you need to turn around in order to enter it. A plinth is a common staple of ancient or civic architecture. It's usually reserved for elevating visitors from the ground plane of the profane world or of the city and on to some other transcendent realm. It's an element for monumentally separating visitors and the building from everything that's around it. On the interior of the Barcelona Pavilion, other distinguishing techniques help to define certain lines and heights as being more important than the others. The fluidity of the plan begins to find contrast with the striations or the very important visual stopping points in this section. Sketches of the Barcelona Pavilion by Mies show us hovering precisely at the middle distance between the floor and the ceiling. The horizontal planes then are rendered either with a defining grid or just the white space of the page, while the exterior is rendered with richly frenzied stroke of his pencil. Our eye line, centered between those blank planes, creates a symmetry or the possibility of mirroring the floor and the ceiling about this central horizontal axis. Where there's almost never symmetry in the plan, here in this direction, it's the favored condition. This is highlighted with two important design moves, the patterning of the marble and the design of the columns. The marble of the walls are laid out in what's called a book-matched pattern. This technique is about slicing the pattern stone and then splaying out the resultant pieces so that the two faces, which used to be in contact so that they have the same pattern, results in a kind of mirror image in the end. The mirror occurs about this middle point between the ceiling and the floor in the overall design of the building. Also, the chrome-clad, plus-shaped columns, they don't register their top as distinct from their bottom. A typical column has three parts, a base, a middle, and a top. But here we only have a middle, so there's no implied directionality. They meet at the ceiling in the same way that they do the floor. It enhances this idea of the symmetry, where the floor and the ceiling are treated in the same way. All this adds up to the construction of an important datum line at the center of the building between the ceiling and the floor. A datum, in compositional terms, is a line about which a composition relates in some way. Like in a musical score, the five lines provide a datum upon which to read the different notes against. Without those lines, we wouldn't be able to see the distinction between the notes. It would just be a series of dots and tails. The datum provides structure and allows us to distinguish between the different things. Around the same time as the design of the Barcelona Pavilion, Mises was working on a house for the Tugendhat family in Chechia. Instead of a building on a plinth to create a new and flat ground, the Tugendhat house is actually built into the side of a hill and uses the height changes as a feature to the house to channel views and to maintain privacy for the inhabitants while doing that. The top floor of the house meets the street. You enter through a gap between two volumes that are connected by a roof plane. This channels your view all the way through the house toward the amazing sight lines of the city that is afforded by the topography. These floors are actually private spaces like the bedrooms. And this seems counterintuitive. You know, normally you would flank the street with more public spaces like the living room. This is typically done for two reasons. One, to make it simpler for guests to engage right at the first threshold of the house. And then secondly, so that the windows into this space usually don't look out into anything that's too sensitive. But here the private spaces on this floor create a buffer. You travel down a staircase into the most public areas, which open completely toward the primary view direction. The space is public, but not visible from the street at all, so you don't feel completely exposed, despite the fact that floor-to-ceiling glass windows line the space. So privacy and unobstructed views are possible all the time. The section and the changes in height in the building, they provide these uninterrupted views and different levels for different types of people and different kinds of interaction. Before we get to 860, 880, we can look at the Crown Hall project to see how some of these develop up close and at a smaller scale. This building embraces symmetry in both plan and in section. 
The main entrance is here at the center of the building, and it also consists of a raised platform and stairs that carry you up to the main level, which is a few feet up off the ground. The roof and the first floor look like the same kind of black plane, like it's been copied upward and held in place by the external supports and the huge steel beams across the top. So these two planes are very similar in form and in color and look a lot alike, but they're obviously very different to occupy. You can't get on the roof, and the other one is completely encased in glass. And the raised first floor also allows for windows to let light into the basement. The first floor is a single, unbroken space for design studios, and then the basement, it provides supporting spaces like the classroom, the shop, and the library. So again, there's no attempt at making the spaces feel continuous in the vertical direction. It's all about difference. The planes that support the activity are the same, but the spaces themselves are very distinct. Even these stairs are designed in such a way so as to express how each one is like a separate object. Each one produces a new plane for occupation. It's completely digital in the sense that everything is discrete. It's either on or off, like a one or a zero, a flat plane or a space stacked up like a sandwich. And this brings us back to 860-880 Lakeshore Drive. Towers for living within are relatively new phenomena at this point. Towers were originally a solution for offices and urban environments, but as cities became more a desirable place to be, more dense living conditions needed to be developed and towers seemed like a natural progress. However, it's not so clear how a tower for living should be designed and built, but Mies had some thoughts about that. These buildings are constructed like a cage with concrete and steel arranged in columns and slabs. This frees up the interior to be reconfigurable, as walls aren't structural, so divisions can be moved or placed anywhere. Each floor could be arranged in a unique way. And the elevator shaft and the plumbing need to be accommodated in a core, but beyond that, each floor is relatively independent from the one that's above or below it. Those floor-to-ceiling glass walls of the Tugendat house, those can be deployed for every single resident in the tower. It's almost impossible to look very far into a unit, so we have privacy and view. And of course today there's towers all around, but when they were built, it would have been more alone. The units facing the water obviously command a premium price for this reason. But these units have another benefit as well, an unobstructed view of the lake complete with your very own horizon. Every single level gets a slightly different view, their own piece of the lake in the sky. The horizon almost seems to travel with you in the unit while they're sitting or standing or walking. The horizon is like this datum of the book matched marble from before, sitting right around eye level at all times. But whereas before it was a static pattern in stone, here it's alive with the changing seasons, with movement and with weather. So while we're looking at the tower, it looks like a repetitive cage or a simple object, but the return on the interior is much, much more. The dream of the glass skyscraper from that 1921 competition as a gleaming object, now it has a section idea that goes with it, and it wouldn't have come in any other way than working it out on these individual houses and smaller buildings on the way to actually constructing that bold dream. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like. You might also enjoy some of these other videos. Subscribing to the channel will help bring these to your video feed every week on Thursdays. Hit that bell to be notified. All your engagement helps, and I also love to continue the conversation down in the comment section below. See you over there.